Welcome to Safety Talk. Personal safety expert Pete Canavan shares his insights and interviews experts who provide simple and effective tips, techniques, and technologies to keep you safe and secure both online and off. Here's Pete. Hello and welcome to Safety Talk. I am your host and personal safety expert, Pete Canavan. I bring over 25 years of personal safety and security experience to my role as the host of this show. As a cybersecurity consultant and martial arts master, I educate, teach, and train others through speaking, consulting, workshops, online courses, and self-defense classes for corporations, colleges, and conferences. You can always learn more about me at my personal site, PeteCanavan.com. Safety Talk discusses and brings attention to a wide range of personal safety and security solutions that are available to businesses, and to individuals, and we cover both the digital world and the physical world. And we've got a really exciting and informative episode for you guys today. On our show, we have a gentleman who has served our country in the U.S. Marines. Uh, he's been an assault team leader, explosive breacher, have to find out what that means, and uh, close quarters battle instructor. So he also knows his hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, he transitioned to law enforcement after his time he spent in the military. And of course, we want to thank him and recognize him for his service. Uh, after military, he worked as a homicide detective in one of America's most violent metropolitan areas. Uh, after assignments uh, as a SWAT sniper and as a vice unit commander, he also joined the global war on terrorism as a contractor and worked in Iraq and Jordan for 12 years from 2004 to 2016, quite a while. Uh, he's worked hundreds of murder cases. Uh, he survived deadly encounters both in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, and has accumulated a treasure chest of valuable lessons and experiences. He's going to be sharing some of those with us today. So this incredible patriot is also a technical advisor for the movie industry as the co-owner of a company called Mo Mission X. Uh, you can see their site, missionx.com, uh, where he trains actors and advises directors on military and police films as well as television. So the bottom line is that he has over 30 years of adventures and experiences while serving as a Marine, as a homicide detective, as a SWAT sniper, military contractor, and as a TV movie advisor. So I want to first and foremost thank him for his service and welcome C.K. Redlinger to Safety Talk. Welcome. Thanks, Pete. Appreciate it. Sure. Quite a, quite a mouthful there to, to get out about you there. You've, you've done a lot and, uh, you know, served your country and, you know, everybody listening, you know, I know appreciates that. So it's really great to have you on the show today. Uh, now, in looking at, at some of the information that, you know, we're going back and forth with email and stuff, I understand that you're, you're focused on helping others, as are we, uh, but doing it through something you, you mentioned called escaping mental captivity, uh, as well as staying safe and overcoming adversity and basically discovering life through the art of storytelling. So I've got to ask you first what mental captivity is and how you define that. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, mental, mental captivity is, is kind of one of the things along with some of the others that you mentioned. And, uh, I found that storytelling, whether it be in the writing form or public speaking, uh, just kind of helps me get the point across when I can tie it to a personal experience and, and kind of breathe a little uh, life into it. But it all comes down to, uh, to mindset, mindset about, uh, I know you're, you're a big advocate of mindset and I, I, Appreciate that, and you and I are on the same wavelength there. Um, mindset's been at the foundation of, of literally everything in my professional career over the last 30 years, and um, so I like to really put a lot of emphasis on it. And I think sometimes, especially in today's modern age, folks um, they can literally get uh, um, kind of mentally enslaved, whether it's you know whatever the case may be, the world of distractions, um, anxiety, depression, whatever the case may be. And I've just always found that um, practicing uh, uh, mental mindset or whether it's combat mindset or whatever kind of mindset you want it to be has just always been a very healthy uh, way of dealing with things and, and providing a much more happier existence, uh, bringing more joy into your life even. Yeah. And I'm a, as you said, I mean, I'm a big proponent of mindset development. And one of the things I talk about a lot in, in teaching and training and wherever it happens to be is is developing the warrior mindset. And I think, you know, people think the warrior mindset, oh, does that mean it's all about fighting? Well, no, because the warrior mindset, if you think about who a warrior is, right, 
I mean, a lot of people will think about a soldier, but you also want to think about like the warriors of old, right? Ancient Japan, you know, the samurai, you know, they had a warrior mindset that was a basically never quit, do or die, no matter what, get the job done kind of thing, right? Like the military. It's a, you're given a job, you do the mission. And you know sometimes and oftentimes that that's a risky mission and you may or may not come back from it, but it doesn't stop you from doing it and making the hard decisions and making the hard choices. And that's really what the warrior mindset is in terms of what how I define it is all about because it helps us overcome obstacles, any obstacles, right? In life, in business, in relationships, we're all faced with these obstacles. And, you know, you go about the mission, right? No matter what the risk is, because you've got a job to do, you've got a task to perform, and it's got to be something that you're 100% committed to. And that's where, you know, really want to dive into that a little bit because, one of the, you know, surviving deadly encounters in the various roles that you've, you know, been in throughout your career, uh, that mental conditioning, that mental toughness, that tenacity, mental tenacity is another great phrase I like to use because it gives yourself sort of that, you know, that ability to overcome the obstacles that stand in front of you. As I always say, you can go, you got to go over, under, through, or around whatever it is that's standing in your way. And the only way you do that is through that 100% commitment. So, you know, what, how do you approach that in what you've done and how you talk to others about that in terms of how to survive things, whatever sure, it is? Sure, sure. Well, you know, I, the, first and foremost, it's, it's, a, it's not one of those tangible things. So people always have a, a hard time kind of con conceptualizing it. But in its essence, it's just an attitude. It's a mental attitude. And I'll give you an example. Um, of where I was really first introduced to mindset and it goes back to 1992. I was in the Marines at the time. I had just come out of a unit and I was assigned as a close quarters battle instructor in, at the schoolhouse. And, and essentially what was going on at that school is, is we were training Marines and providing them with a skill set uh, that essentially allowed them to um, uh, assault a location, a place, a structure, uh, and be able to go in and dominate, eliminate, and control the environment. And usually that involved um, uh, advanced marksmanship skills, uh, sur surgical shooting, close-in shooting. It's a very violent and dangerous type of environment for, the, uh, for, for these Marines to be operating in. So when we would get a class, we'd start a class, um, you know, there's a lot that would go into this four-week program. And a lot of, you know, you're spending a lot of time live firing shooting houses, a lot of advanced marksmanship and so on. But before we stepped on any range and before we loaded any magazines, the very first class that we would give was mindset. Now, you may ask yourself, you know, why in such a dynamic type of skill, why are you doing this? And it was known before it even became such a sexy term today, you know, way back then, it was known that um, before you can put all the, the cool guy gear on before you can uh, be armed with whatever latest weaponry you think is the, is the in thing. Um, none of that matters if you haven't conditioned your mind and got your mental attitude in the right place. So um, I, I would always start, I was fortunate. I was a young Marine. I was like 20, you know, three, 24 years old back then. And um, I would start my mindset class with, uh, with a quote and it was, you know, the sword is more important than the shield. Skill is more important than either. The final weapon is the brain. All else is supplemental. And what we would try to get across to these young Marines who are about to embark on this journey is that I don't care what kind of weapon you have, whether you have a weapon or not, I don't care what equipment you have, I don't even care what training you've got. If you haven't adopted the proper mental mindset, if you haven't played these things out in your mind's eye before you even get there, if you haven't won the battle in your mind before you even step onto the battlefield, then you're going to end up in a whole different set of circumstances than you would if you prepare now. And that uh, philosophy got me through the last 30 years. It got me through being in uh, a deadly encounter, being in a shootout, and walking out the other side and understanding that um, um, okay, this was something that I trained for. It's part of the job. I gave, my permit, I gave myself permission uh, that this would probably happen at some point in my career. 
and that if it was a righteous incident, then I shouldn't have to become a, a psychiatric casualty afterwards. I shouldn't have to fixate on something or go down a rabbit hole. Um, it, it's simply part of the job, and I should be able to sleep at night for the rest of my life. And I and think so some people don't, don't adopt that mindset, and then they're much more, um, they're much more uh, subjected to going down that rabbit hole and becoming uh, fixated and, and finding a dark place and, and eventually maybe something really bad happening. I do the same thing in my martial arts and self-defense classes, whether it's a, a half-day seminar or with a white belt just starting out day one. And that is, I tell them right off the bat, look, I could teach you the coolest move. I could teach you something that could save your life someday. But if you can't bring yourself to do it, what good is it? And why even bother learning it? So I start right out like you do with mindset because you, you have to have the proper mindset. You have to be able to, to make that 100% commitment to yourself before you, know, you step on a battlefield as you did or you step into a self-defense situation or have to protect yourself. If you can't bring yourself to do the things that are necessary to survive, then all is lost, right? I mean, it's for nothing because you have, that's where, it's, that's where it begins. <clears throat> Once you have that proper mindset, now the technical side of it, now the skill side of it all sort of can come together because you, are, you know that you're going to be able to execute when the time comes. And as you said, you play that scenario over in your head. And I'm sure you're familiar with, um, with some of the, the training out there about that, like the bulletproof mind, for example where, you know, there are examples w that, um, that's, uh, what's his name? Um, Grossman. Yes. Uh, Dave Grossman, where he talks about, you know, a lot of times even, you know, people in the military, people in law enforcement that have to deal with situations on a daily basis don't think about what could be the unthinkable. Like, you know, their partner is, you know, moments away from, you know, having their head kicked in or being shot and killed, and they're unable to get there and save them, you know, physically, but they may have a clear, clear shot at the person, but they can't bring themselves to do it because they're like, oh my God, can I, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. Well, no, you must do it. You should have thought about it ahead of time because that's your partner. That's somebody who you, is family to you that has got your back and you've got to have their back. And all of that stuff has to be played in your mind ahead of time because at the speed of fight, right? we don't want to have to be facing ourselves with decisions that we should have the answer to before we even got to that point. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm a huge fan. And I mean, a huge fan. And it's always been part of, um, of, of my, my lessons and in instruction is, uh, is mentally rehearsing things, uh, to the point, um, <clears throat> to the point to where things are extremely vivid. And, and I'll, before I tell you, uh, like an example, I'll, I'll just say that, and, and, you know, you know how this works. You know, you've got these two parts of your brain and you've got a subconscious, you know, where all your programming is, yeah. and, you know, first seven years of your life, everything's getting programmed. And then that thinking brain takes over. And then, you know, that's what we're doing, walking around think, using that thinking brain all day long. But in the, in the, in the background, that programming, whatever bad habits, good habits, whatever the case may be, is constantly running. And you know, it has that deep, that subconscious has that default setting. You know, we always hear about, you know, uh, run or fight, you know, there's a posture component as well. And so, you know, you've, you've got to find ways to, um, to basically hack that part of your subconscious and, and mentally rehearsing allows you to do that. Um, one of the things that I used to do uh, a lot when I was a young patrol officer, uh, between 911 calls, I would, uh, really immerse myself into a, a scenario. Say, for example, I'm you know, driving down whatever avenue and I see a bank there and I start to kind of think, okay, I'm thinking about an armed robbery. You know, I get a radio call. It's an armed robbery in progress at that bank. I know where the door is. And I'm thinking about driving there, you know, lights and siren. I'm thinking about my heart, you know, beating out of my chest at 120 beats per minute. I'm thinking about the radio cracking in my ear. I'm thinking about pulling up. I see two individuals walk out. You know, they've got long guns and body armor and masks. And I think about how frightening to a certain degree that will look to me. Uh, and then I think about, you know, a gun battle that starts to ensue back and forth. 
And I think about, you know, my, the positioning of myself behind the engine block. And I'm thinking about round snapping by my head, hitting my windshield and, and splintering, you know, cracking the windshield and bouncing off the hood. And I'm thinking about laying fire down. And I'm uh, imagining even worst case scenarios like, you know, uh, round goes through the bicep. I look over, you know, it's got an arterial bleed. Now I'm thinking about throwing a tourniquet on. I'm imagining every single detail, the twisting of the windlass, and to the point to where I get it cinched down. And now I'm thinking about getting back in the fight. I'm thinking about doing a magazine change, speed reload. I'm thinking about putting rounds down range. And ultimately, it always has to end this way. It has to end the same way, where you win and they lose. That's got to be burned into your brain. So I see those suspects go down, and that's how it has to end. And so what happens is, is in the subconscious, that ends up being a file that gets filed down there. And the more repetitions that you put, as you know, with anything, any skill, it gets put into that muscle memory. And then Absolutely. you've got you, something. Humans are the only ones that can program our own subconscious. People don't realize yeah. that. But it, yeah. that's exactly what you're doing. Yes. We, can, we can hack it. And once we start doing that, we have other options than the automatic default out of the box of run or fight or posture. And that's really, it's as simple as that. And it's not anything that is complex or difficult. It's just a game of doing it and repeating it over and over. And involving as many senses as possible, smells, sights, sounds, and making it as real as possible because to the subconscious, it doesn't know that. To the subconscious, it appears real. So we can, like you, you talk about hacking your subconscious and installing that, that proper mission programming. That's exactly what we're doing is we're programming in those scenarios how we want them to play out. And make, like you said, it's a <clears throat> file that gets put back there so that if that situation or something similar to it occurs, it's like, oh, it's almost like you've been there before. And you, you have already seen what the outcome uh, is going to be before it ever happens. And that is way more powerful and beneficial than getting to that point and going, oh my God, I hope I don't get shot and killed, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a completely different way of looking at any situation, really. I mean, we're looking at it from a, you know, potentially a life and death situation, but people have to realize that they can program their minds and their subconscious for anything, you know, for whatever goal, for whatever thing they're trying to achieve, it becomes much more real and it becomes much more possible when we begin to hack our subconscious and install the proper programming to allow it to occur, you know, and just kind of then let it go. It's like, okay, this is what I want to have happen. This is what it's going to look like. It's what it's, what it's going to sound like. It's what it's going to feel like. It's what it's going to smell like, whatever. And now the, the brain is like, oh, wow. It's like, it's almost like it happened. Well, and, and the beauty about it is, is some, some people would hear this conversation and think, this is nuts. You know, it's, uh, um, why would you want to think those kinds of negative thoughts? You know, those negative thoughts are unhealthy. It's actually the opposite. This, right. when, when, when you do this, it creates a calming effect. It, it creates a calming effect in your mind because now, over time, your mind is actually in your, your everything about you. There's a confidence level there. And so... Usually when people are fearful or they're nervous or they have anxiety about stuff, it's because their mind is running wild about the possibilities. It's kind of like if, you, uh, if you've never been punched in the face before and you, you're, gonna ha you're always going to have this fear of personal aggression. You're always going to worry about what it must be like. It must be the worst thing in the world to get punched in the face. Um, once you've been punched in the face or you've been through some training or sparred or whatever the case may be, that actually creates a calming effect, and you don't uh, you, you don't sit there and, and obsess about something like that. This is no different. The obsession goes away, and you actually live a more kind of joyful life because your mind understands that okay, we've got this all figured out. We got a plan, and you know we can move on with the rest of our life and not have to obsess about it. And that's why planning is so important for any sort of preparedness, any sort of situation, you know, whether it's emergency preparedness, whether it's for something that we're undertaking at home, whether it's planning for, you know, maybe a training you're going through at work, uh, you know, regarding workplace violence or an active shooter or, you know, a home invasion or whatever it happens to be. Or it could be something that's not that detrimental or that bad, but 
having those scenarios play through and thinking about it ahead of time, as you said, it produces a much more calming effect because you know what you're going to do. And if you have a plan and you know what you're going to do, all of a sudden, what happens to the stress levels? They come way down because it's like, oh, I know what to do because I trained for this. And if you've never trained for it and now something comes up and it's completely unknown, that's when we get fearful. That's when we get stressed out. That's when the mind starts to race and think of all kinds of crazy things. And it's hard to focus and it's hard to, you know, even articulate, you know, you have trouble, you know, you get what happens with the, you know, the fight or flight, right? You get the tunnel vision, you can't hear, things slow down. It's like a really weird experience. But if you've trained and you've been there, when something like that happens, it's like, okay, this is normal. This is what I'm going to do next. And it, it, it does, it produces a calming effect. And it's the opposite of, unfortunately, what a lot of people think, which is, oh, why would you think these, these things? Well, I think about them because if something were to occur, I want to know what I'm going to do. Well, one, one of the tenets of uh, Stoicism, the Stoics used to do this similar kind of thing so that they could, you know, Stoicism is largely about, you know, controlling yourself and controlling your life for what you can control. And they would do these kinds of exercises as well. You brought up uh, Colonel Grossman earlier. Um, you know, Colonel Grossman often says that, uh, you know, denial, which would be the opposite of what we're talking about, you know, is a save now, pay later, you know, scam in a sense of, um, you know, it's great to think that you're living this utopian world and, you know, nothing bad's ever going to happen. But then when it does, um, it, you, one, you're less likely to survive, you know, a deadly encounter. And then two, if you do survive, you're more likely to become uh, a psychiatric casualty. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, you fixate on something. If you survive, maybe you get survivor's guilt. Maybe you fixate on something. You, you just get really tangled up in that nightmare. And that can take you years and years down the road. And can obviously, as we see often in our, in our world, culminate in a very tragic situation. So um, by That's working, what we definitely do not want to have happen. <laughs> right. And so by doing what people, some people might think is, um, is, is, is too scary to think about or whatever the case may be, uh, is actually having um, the opposite effect. It's that calming. It's um, a plan that's in place. It's that programming, that subconscious programming that is now running the program you want it to. And you go and you live your life. And God forbid, you never have to worry about that one random act that might just come visit you in the night. But if you do, you know, it's, it's, it's likely to turn out much more beneficial for you than if you did. Sure. And, and, you know, things, we never know what's going to happen. I mean, we could take the, the situation that's going on right now with this big outbreak of the coronavirus in China and think, oh my God, you know, could this be some sort of global pandemic? Well, sure it could. I mean, have people really thought about it much? Well, some of us have, right? I mean, I'm sure you have, I know I have. Um, so what do you do? Well, you, you prepare, you know, you make sure you have, you know, masks, you make sure that you, you have you do certain precautions because you've played over a scenario like that. Most people have never even thought about it because the thought of something like that happening is like so remote. But mm -hmm. just because a situation isn't, you know, something that might happen, you know, in a common way, uh, like an active shooter. I mean, I think the stats are you got a greater chance of getting struck by lightning twice <laughs> than being a victim of an active shooter attack. Now, does that mean you should not train for it? Absolutely not. Because it could happen. And doing that is a way of preparing and lowering those stress levels. And, you know, you, you, you sent over some, some really interesting uh, uh, things that uh, sort of I, I think would illustrate that. And I'll, I'll let you tell uh, the story. You said that one of them, you know, talking about adversity and, and overcoming things was uh, something about your uncle. Where you said that he was uh, one of uh, 10 people that survived for eight days after a, a torpedo uh, sunk their ship. And uh, I mean, think about the sort of mental tenacity and the mindset and how you deal with something like that. So I'll let you kind of fill in. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, this is actually one of my favorite stories. And, uh, oh. and, and growing up, growing up, you know, I, 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 I was very fortunate growing up. I, I call it land, uh, growing up in the land of giants because my, uh, my mother and father were both U.S. Marines, uh, both oh, went wow. in about 1950 in that era. 
Um, my mother, she had uh, several brothers, uh, most of which were um, uh, older than her. So they were World War II guys, and they were all in the, in the military, Navy, um, uh, mostly Navy, one Army guy, and the same on my dad's side of the family. But one particular uh, brother of my mother, my uncle, uh, his name was Wyatt Butterfield, and um, he was assigned uh, on the USS Juno. And uh, if you're familiar with the five Sullivan brothers, uh, all five Sullivan brothers were also killed on this ship when it sank. Hmm. And it was actually inspiration for the film Saving Private Ryan. So, oh, um, okay. so there were seven, seven, 700 plus sailors on that ship. And it was right after uh, the Battle of Guadalcanal. And uh, the ship was involved in some heavy fighting. It was kind of limping away, you know, to try to get... Uh, back to a, a place where it could be, you know, fixed and they could kind of reassemble themselves. And uh, they were hit by a torpedo from a Japanese submarine. And when it hit the ship, uh, it hit the magazine of the ship, which created a magnificent explosion. Uh, my uncle was in a gun turret. Uh, so he was, everything was dark. The turret was filling up with water. Um, the other sailors in the turret, which is a very small area, were killed instantly. He was able to uh, get out of the turret, and uh, what he saw before him was was literally uh, nothing, just wounded you know, sailors in the water. Uh, everybody was covered with oil, and uh, everybody's just looking for you know, some way to, uh, uh, to climb onto something. So he was able to climb onto a raft, and... Over the next eight days, um, maybe about 120 sailors made it into the water after the uh, explosion. And uh, the numbers just dwindled down every day, every night, right before his eyes, watching uh, his fellow sailors and friends being eaten alive by sharks, watching, watching them succumb from their wounds, watching them um, go delirious from drinking salt water and saying something like, hey, I'm gonna go down to the galley and get a sandwich and then go over the side of the raft and then be ripped apart by, by sharks. And he used to always tell a story about his father. He used to always tell him, say, uh, you know, Butterfields don't die young. And uh, if it's too tough for everybody else, it's just right for us. So this was him getting a mindset from his wow. own father, you know. And he said that after several days, the guys that were left were actually like welcoming death. They would see the next guy die and they were like, he's lucky, you know, and, uh, and, and he even wanted to welcome death at that point. But he thought about the words from his father, um, that mindset kicking in and, uh, and held out. So he, he, he was one of the final 10. And then uh, the, the, the really interesting part of the story was is a PBY plane flew over and spotted them and dropped a, uh, a package and a note. They were not cleared to land. A PBY could land in the water, but they didn't want them landing in the ocean. So um, this thing lands like 50 feet away from the raft, and these guys are exhausted, and they're paddling and paddling with their hands, and they just can't catch up to the package. And so oh. um, my uncle um, extends his hand to everybody and uh, shakes everybody's hand and says, I'm going to go for it. And uh, one of the other sailors uh, had a Bowie knife. He's, you know, back in World War II, they were a lot smaller. Gave it to him, he took it, and he slipped off into the water, and he thought at any point he would be ripped apart. Um, he told the guys, he said, tell my parents, you know, what I did here today. And he swam out, and everything was fine until he got there. And then he got that package, and he started swimming back, and that's when he started to see the sharks rolling in. Oh, and uh, he felt them brushing up against his legs, and he, he thought, he goes, this is it. Let me just go out with a fight. He took the knife and just started slashing wildly in the water. Um, his, the guys in the raft were screaming at him and so on, and uh, he felt resistance with the knife. And uh, he just grabbed the package and went for it. They pulled him in, and apparently he, he hit something, and the sharks just devoured whatever he hit, probably another shark. Unbelievable. Pilots up above saw this and were like, we're, we're defying orders. We're landing this plane after what we've just seen. And they did, and they drug those guys in. Uh, they all passed out. My uncle was, uh, was awarded uh, the Bronze Star for that. And, um, 
and that was the story. And it just wow. you know, was part of our, his legacy and part of our, our family growing up. But if, if that's not overcoming adversity, I, I don't know what is. Gosh, yeah, I mean, that takes some some big cojones to jump in the water with full of sharks to try to retrieve something to to save yourself and your fellow, you know, sailors to because you, you have no other option. It's, you know, that's the kind of mental toughness that not a lot of people have, especially after so many days and seeing so much happen around you. The type of mindset that somebody like that has is is hard to describe, I'm sure. That's incredible. What a great way to, to, to sort of understand, though, right, the, the type of mindset that someone can exhibit and then to be, to, you know, you then grew up hearing that story and that instilled in you that sense of never quit, never give up, you know, there's always an option, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure that also came back to you many times over the years uh, when you were faced with things and said, hey, man, if my uncle could do that, you know, this is nothing, right? Yeah, I, I, I say that uh, fortitude is measured in minutes and inches, you know, and uh, this, was, this was captured in the movie uh, Any Given Sunday when Al Pacino is giving his big halftime speech and he's talking about, uh, you know, taking it an inch at a time and, mm-hmm. you know, climbing out of hell one inch at a time back into the light. And, um, you know, I always, you know, I used to always say, you know, if you're, if you feel like you're outmatched and you feel like it looks like you're just going to, it looks really bad. It just doesn't look like you're going to make it. Just fight one minute longer, 60 seconds, just fight Mm -hmm. 60 seconds longer. And that's what you tell yourself in your mind. And then you repeat it 60 more seconds and then 60 more seconds. And then that accumulation of time before you know it, is just enough to, to, to bring you into the win column. because That's a fantastic thing for people to take away from this, is that when you think that there are no other options, that you're, you're out of options, that it's, it, things look hopeless, tell yourself that. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great takeaway, CK, is to say, hey, just 60 more seconds, you know, one more minute. I can do this for one more minute, whether it's swimming or fighting or, you know, dealing with something. Um, and then, you know, you, you come through the other side victorious, hopefully, right, and, and survive. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, I think, that really epitomized this. Um, when, when I was a homicide detective, a, uh, there was a guy, his, his girlfriend broke up with him, and he decided to go and crawl in her window one night. And she had moved on. She had a new boyfriend and everything. And, uh, and so he, this guy, he got a kitchen knife. He went up into her bedroom while she was sleeping. And she, he just started hacking away on the boyfriend and her. The boyfriend jumped out the window and took off, and, and she's there by herself. Um, she had a roommate, too. She jumped out uh, and took off and went and called the police. And this guy um, s- stabbed her in that room. She fought and fought. And then she ran into a bathroom. He kicked that door in, stabbed her more times there. Uh, there was cast off in every room of this townhome. That you know, once we got there, she fought there. She went into the next, got away from, went into the next room. This happened in several rooms until the point where the first responding officer uh, kicks in the door, and she's she's literally sliding down the stairs of the townhome, stabbed sixty plus times, and she's still fighting. Oh and my god! The guy was taken into custody. We get there, you know, it was a, a horrific scene in every room. And I just remember seeing her at the following court proceedings. And I mean, she was, she was, went through multiple surgeries and just looked like a big chew tip at the, you know, every time we saw her, but just the fortitude and, and just proving that it doesn't matter if you're still breathing or it doesn't matter how much blood you think you've lost. If you're still breathing, you're conscious, you're still in the fight. And this woman took 60 stab wounds and she was still, just fighting and fighting and fighting. And I thought, you know, that was just, it was amazing. And that just, if that taught me a lesson, you know, I thought I knew something about something, but I didn't know anything about it until I saw that happen. That's incredible. And it's, it's true in a fight though. If you're, if you're aware enough to realize you're hurt, you're aware enough that you can continue to fight. 
once you black out, you black out, right? But if you're a release, if you're still conscious enough to know what's going on, you're you're conscious enough to to be able to continue to fight and to, to do what's right. necessary to try to survive. Sixty seconds, sixty more 60 seconds. seconds at a time. Just keep repeating. I like that. So, all right. I, well, we're going to talk about awareness in a minute, but I gotta we're going to segue into that because one of the other things you you talked about is sort of on that same topic of adversity and mindset. Um, Tell us a bit about uh, the 30 days of fighting to protect the Department of State officials in Iraq back in 04, which uh, was a topic of the book Sniper One. Yeah, so uh, back in 2000, well, I, I left policing in 2004, early 2004, and I went over to Iraq kind of at the height of the insurgency. And I was down in uh, the southern part of Iraq, which has become, you know, has come up lately because of the uh, uh, the, the Iranian influence and our recent uh, um, targeting of uh, Soleimani, uh, General Soleimani that uh, we took out at, at, at the uh, Baghdad airport recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I was down there, um, a lot of the fighting that was going on was uh, Iranian influenced. So um, they were either um, um, providing the militants down there uh, technology and hardware that was used against us, <clears throat> or, uh, you know, they come over the, the, the border and do things themselves. But down in Alamara, where, where I was with uh, my team, we were co-located with a British platoon um, who was essentially helping us protect this postage stamp size piece of land in the middle of the city. And it was uh, uh, on two sides of this piece of property was the Tigris River. So it kind of did an L shape. And uh, we had this um, big water tower in the center of this very small piece of property. And it was a perfect aiming stake for um, insurgents dropping um, indirect fire into our location, more, mostly you know, mortars and things like that. And so for 30 days, um, we were just defending this location from uh, small arms fire, from uh, assaults, from you know, in between buildings and things like that, and uh, RPGs being launched into the um, to the location and then just constant, constant indirect fire from mortars. And, um, so sniper one, uh, written by Sergeant Dan Mills is one of the British, uh, soldiers on the sniper team there that we were, uh, uh, palling around with constantly. So every time we, we go up to the rooftop, uh, this three story building <clears throat> with their team and we would try to, um, spot and, uh, target and so on. And, um, it was just, it was a really long 30 days. And uh, uh, eventually it culminated with um, a pretty significant um, counterattack with Spectre gunship and, you know, um, anti uh, uh, armored vehicles and tanks and just rolling through the city and just kind of taking care of business. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was, it was definitely an interesting, interesting ride. 30 days of getting constantly just pummeled with stuff. It's got to be tough to, to just deal with that on, you know, from the mental side of it. Like, it's like, is it, you know, when is this going to end? And, and, you know, you start thinking about all kinds of things. Cause that's, they, they, that's a long time. It probably felt like a heck of a lot longer than 30 days. Well, there, there's a psychological effect um, associated with, with mortars coming in. And, and so what would happen is, is, um, you'd hear you hear the initiation of the uh, of the of the uh, mortar being dropped into the of the shell being dropped into the tube. It, mm -hmm. You know, has a distinctive signature, and you can hear that from a distance. And as soon as you hear that, then it's like you're just waiting because you know it's going to hit on the property. And um, they would come. Th we we were living in trailers, you know, and they would just come through the roofs. Uh, they would just pop right through the roof and just destroy you know these things we had one that went through our um, into our kitchen area and uh and just you know peppered that thing with shrapnel um we had, must have uh, felt helpless it's at, you know to a certain it, degree yeah it is and and you know dark humor starts to set in and um i remember one specific uh we we heard you know we went up to the rooftop because we had incoming we're trying to uh trying to figure out where it was coming from it was nightfall and this thing this particular one came and it hit uh, one of the bunkers where two, two of the guys were in. Fortunately, they did, they ducked down under the sandbags of the, of the edges of the bunker and it hit the top of the sandbags 
where it's, it's where it detonated. So they missed. They were safe from the shrapnel, but the you know the 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 uh, overpressure from the explosion, um, you know, messed up their eardrums and everything else. So as soon as it happened, you know, we all ran down there to uh, see if they were alive. And I remember climbing up into this bunker, and you know, we we see that they're okay, and we're kind of laughing, and okay, you're okay. And I remember turning around, and one of the guys had a pet pigeon. He took around with him everywhere. And this pigeon was sitting on the opposite side of the bunker, which was only several feet, and it was sitting on top of the uh, sandbags. And it looked like something out of it. It was alive, but it looked like a scene out of a cartoon because it was just kind of doing this, and its <laughs> eyes were like going back and forth. <laughs> he caught some of that overpressure. It was alive and it lived, but... You know, it made for a great story. And of course, once we realized everybody was okay, you know, it turned into a big, big joke. But um, yeah, but uh, definitely no joke when it's happening. And that's, uh, you know, I mean, you, you've seen things that most people haven't. And uh, so I, I appreciate you sharing some of those stories because, you know, people have to understand that, you know, the adversity that most of us face on a daily basis and the adversity that we may face at some point in the future is most likely just pales in comparison to some of the things that, you know, someone like yourself has been through and has seen. And as someone who is, has done that and has lived through it and has had that mindset and that tenacity to be able to overcome situations, multiple situations that were, you know, pretty, pretty dire and pretty dark and, and, you know, helpless and hopeless at times, uh, people have to realize that there is always hope, that there is always a way. And if we succumb to that, that hopelessness, that there is nothing else that we can do, you know, all is lost. And so you have to have that, you know, another 60 seconds, another 60 seconds, you know, I will get through this, you know, there, think, there, there are things that could be worse. Uh, you know, if you're aware enough to know you're hurt, you're aware enough to know you fight, that kind of thing. And and it's the stuff that a lot of, you know, a lot of times people don't like to think about because it is uncomfortable. And just because you don't think about something doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And so ignorance, although bliss, is no excuse for lack of preparedness, no matter what happens to be. And we have to take a look at our daily lives. You know, where do we go? What do we do? Who do we interact with? Uh, and take a look and analyze what are some of the th potential threats that we could face in our daily lives, right? You know, what is it that we do? Where is it that we go uh, that could potentially be uh, risky at some point? And then play those situations and those scenarios over in our minds and say, well, if I'm at the supermarket and, you know, somebody tries to, to kidnap me, you know, or my kids, you know, what would I do? You know, how would I react? How should I even get to that point in the first place? And so that's kind of a good segue into what I want to talk about next, which is, is that awareness, which is something that obviously, you know, the whole military thing, you know, is, is your situational awareness. And I, I always stress that awareness as well, because one of my personal sayings is we need to all be, quote, armed with awareness, because when we're armed with awareness, it's not something that can be taken away from you. It's not like a weapon, like pepper spray or a gun or a knife or whatever. It's something that's with us all the time if we let it be with us all the time. It can't be taken away. Uh, and so that's where just having your head on a swivel and not being distracted by technology and not being distracted by other things and not being complacent because we're caught up in our routines and our comfort zones and the things that make us feel good. And really, we don't think about the things that could occur. And that becomes a problem when we have that level of complacency that gets high because we don't pay as much attention to the surroundings as we should. And you listed something um, about, you know, the for housing for French volunteers or something with the 96 Olympics and the Centennial Park bombing and uh, and how that sort of kind of ties in with this whole, you know, awareness and the, the awareness of, of problems that can occur. So maybe you can sort of use that as an example to illustrate yeah. to people the importance of awareness and how important it is for people. Well, you know, I, I start by saying, I think, I think of, can, I think of, uh, Aware, secure, security awareness or just general awareness, whatever awareness, I think of it as kind of a, on a continuum. 
you know, on one end of the continuum, you've got um, um, ultra paranoia, you know, which, which none of us want to, to be. We don't want to live our lives, you know, just in prepper mode kind of thing. Uh, and then on the other end of the continuum, you've got, um, you know, complete head in the sand denial and complacency. And like with just about anything else in life, you know, the best place to hang out is kind of in the middle. And, um, and when it comes to security awareness or situational awareness, um, that's not real hard to do. Um, like you mentioned, you know, it's just, you know, head up, shoulders back. Um, you know, don't be looking at your phone while you're walking around or crossing the street or walking through the parking lot at night. Um, even the other day, um, we, we like to go for walks and, um, we're sitting at a busy intersection trying to cross it. And, um, you know, my son sometimes likes to think just because the light is red, that means the cars will stop. And I'm, and he's got his back turned towards where all the action is happening. And I'm like, turn around, look at all those 2000 pound missiles coming at you, you know, <laughs> driven by human beings that occasionally like to look at their phone and pop the curb. So right. <clears throat> gotta be ready to dart out of the way. So um, sometimes it's just as simple as that. It doesn't even have to be a worst case scenario that you're preparing for. Right. Um, but the, you, you mentioned the, um, uh, the young French volunteers at the 96 Olympics. So I was, a, I was a cop in Atlanta during the 96 Olympics and I was, uh, I was working a, a beat in my patrol car and uh, uh, I worked Southeast Atlanta, Decatur, which is a pretty rough part of town. And um, you know, being familiar with my surroundings and having some situational awareness, I suddenly saw these people that were completely out of place and, uh, and just walking around and, and I stopped them. I'm curious of who they are and why they're there. And they were a bunch of young, um, French volunteers that the Olympic committee brought in. Um, the Olympic committee didn't do their, due diligence on where they were putting them and then put them in a crack hotel um, <laughs> in this part of town. And I'm talking, this is, you know, this is a hotel that is uh, synonymous with uh, any kind of problem you can, you know, you can think of. And um, so I, I tried to explain to them, I'm like, it, it's not safe for you guys to be staying in this hotel. And um, I'm sure a lot of it was out of their control, but, Within 24 hours, every one of their rooms have been broken into and all of their stuff have been taken. And, and thank God that's the most that happened to them. Luckily, they got them out of there, but um, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if armed robbery would have been, you know, the next thing on the hit list for them. Sure. But, and then um, it could obviously escalate from there. It could be worse, you know, if there were females there. I mean, just, you know, yeah. you think about, you know, some sort of forced sexual assault or, or worse, you know, or maybe they don't have the things that the person's looking for. You don't have enough money, yeah. you know, and now they want it, to take it out in pounds of flesh instead. Yeah. And, and so in this case, it wasn't their, their fault as much as it was the situational awareness by the people that put them in that location and, and put them at grave risk, to be honest with you. What is your philosophy on that uh, and your, your thoughts on, on situational awareness personally? Um, I think that, uh, I, I always think back to like our ancestors and, um, you know, from the day they're born, um, their situational awareness is being dealt with from day one. I mean, their, <clears throat> their situational awareness is being trained through stress inoculation. You know, it's <laughs> threats in the cave, threats in the trees, you know, threats everywhere. And, um, you're, you're, your parents or whoever's raising you is essentially uh, teaching you through things that are actually happening. So your antenna is, is honed and it's up and the radar is working really well. Your instincts are sharp here in the modern era. Um, you know, a lot of people, most people probably um, their antenna is not up anymore. And what gut instinct they may be feeling or what sixth sense they might be getting um most people tend to be dismissive of it and um that's crazy because animals would never do that um right. you know a zebra in the wild um suddenly gets the instinct or the the sixth sense that 
something is not right, but it can't quite put its finger on it, you know? And what does it do? It decides to relocate. Um, it doesn't do what we commonly do, which is just like, eh, you know, it's probably nothing. Or, you know, I'm walking down the sidewalk and I see uh, some, some guys loitering on the corner and I've seen guys loitering the corner there before, but for some reason I just got a really weird feeling. Um, when you start ignoring that, which, which we tend to do because we, you know, sometimes it's associated with offending somebody, you know, if I cross the street, maybe they'll be offended. Oh, we could go and down then, that road. Oh. And then, um, <laughs> you know, so we don't, we, we tend to be dismissive of our, our, of our instincts and that can, that can end up deadly. Um, so that's, that's my philosophy on that. I think, uh, the, the right thing to do is, um, take action when you feel that, you know, those goose pimples on your arm or the hair come up on the back of your neck. Um, that's God's gift that you should recognize. And worst case scenario, you, whatever, I mean, you have to make an apology at the end of the day, but, um, it's better than walking into, uh, you know, walking into the lion's mouth, so to speak. Absolutely. And, you know, th like you said, that gut feeling exists for a reason. When you have that gut feeling, it's probably right. Uh, and I think anybody who's ever, you know, experienced that, pretty much probably everybody, you know, you, you get a feeling that just something isn't right or something, you know, is off or, and <clears throat> many times that gets borne out later on. It's like, oh my God, do you know that I, I thought something funny was going on there? And next thing you know, an hour later, boom, something happens and you, and you find out about it and you go, oh my God, I knew there was something not right, you know? And, uh, and that's a scary thing because we are so distracted by technology. We are so busy, right? Everybody's busy, busy, busy. Got so many things to do. I'm running here, running there. I'm busy at work, busy at home, busy with the kids, you know, driving them to practices and trying to, you know, pay the bills and, you know, plan for some downtime. And, and, and it's just, there's so much that we have to deal with today that our society is so fast paced that if we all just took a step back once in a while, daily if you can, right? And just spend 10 minutes just calming our, ourselves down a little bit and spending a little quiet time. You know, it's not necessarily meditation, but it is a kind of meditation to just calm our minds. And it will help in so many ways because it, it allows us to sort of, you know, block out all of the things that bombard us every day. And I think it's something that's very healthy that people need to do, but unfortunately, most people don't because they think they don't have time for 10 minutes. Well, if you don't have time for 10 minutes, I mean, come on, right? How much time do you waste watching TV or, you know, doing things that are non-productive that if you just took, you know, 10 or 15 minutes out of your day once in a while to let yourself sort of, you know, calm down and get more in touch with your, your inner self, uh, I think we would all be better off for it. <laughs> uh, I 100% I agree with you. Um, I mean, it, it sounds kind of crazy, but what I've been doing for a very long time is, you know, because like you said, we're all busy. You know, I, I feel like my life is full of things all day long. And <clears throat> sometimes, you know, if I, whatever, I don't get a workout in and I feel bad for the rest of the day. So um, what I do is as soon as I wake up, you know, I'll go into my closet and I will do some, I'll force myself every morning to do some exercise in there. I'll do some push-ups, I'll do some sit-ups, um, I'll stretch, I'll just sit quietly and just kind of prep my mind for the day. And when I do that, even if I don't go and work out later on in the day, I don't feel guilty, I don't feel bad because I know it was tackled already and it just kind of provides a nice calming effect for the rest of the day. And if I do get to go work out, then it's value added. But, um, but just having that moment also to just get your mind right and not just jumping into making breakfast or, you know, getting the kids out to school or, you know, driving them to school, whatever the case may be. Um, I, I when I started doing that, I, I noticed a significant difference in my happiness. Yeah, and it's and you say it's a it's a little thing, but it yields huge results, and and that's important, especially today, because you know we're all nuts. There's a million things going on. We get you know between phone calls and emails and texts and every other type of social media out there. Uh, not to mention dealing with 
you know, our jobs and our bosses and our kids and our spouses. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it gets crazy. And so it's important. So obviously not everybody has the training that you've had. They haven't had training in, you know, dealing with, you know, how to prepare for a worst case scenario, right? Uh, people that are in the safety and security industry, people that are in the military, they do because it's, it's part of your job to, to deal with that. So what would you say to those people who don't have that experience, you know, to the, to the average, you know, man or woman or, or teenager or child that how do they help get themselves in that proper mindset for, you know, basically a worst case scenario? Well, I, I, I'll always go back to mentally rehearsing and you don't need any, you don't need anybody to really teach you how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You can just look around your own world and ask yourself the question in a reasonable thought process, what could happen? What, what's, what's likely to happen more than anything? Okay. I don't think you know, stormtroopers are going to come down and, and, and get me. Right, likely but, encounters. But yeah, what, what <laughs> Don't worry about the aliens attacking. <laughs> yeah. I could have a fire in my house. Okay, right. that's reasonable. Um, I could have a car accident that's, you know, that's catastrophic. Um, I could be walking out of a store in the, or the mall at night and – um, could run into uh, a mugger or a robber or someone wanting to do much worse. Um, so list those kinds of things out in your head. And then there's a great starting point. And then you just start to tackle them through that mental rehearsal and you start to, you know, play them out and um, play that movie it, in your mind. Yeah. And it could be something as simple as, okay, I'm walking through the mall parking lot and someone tries to abduct me. You know, they, they, whatever they have a calm voice but they're like hey they got a weapon and they're just like hey listen come on just i just need you to get in the trunk everything's gonna be okay i'm not gonna hurt you just get into the trunk it'll be fine and that that tricks so many people because people hold out for hope and they think okay well you know if i just do what he says i'll be okay and um but now you have the opportunity to play this out in your mind and you can tell you, you can, you can select the option that you want while your thinking brain is working. And right. you can tell yourself, no, I'm never going to get in that trunk. I'd rather fight and die in this parking lot where I'm more likely to get medical attention and survive where this person is. I'm going to put up such a fight that this person knows that I'm causing so much commotion that they're going to just take off and just throw their hands up. Right. Um, but the last thing I want to do is get into that trunk. So this is the time to think about that. And then once that file gets put into that folder in your subconscious, you're good to go. And Yeah, like if somebody boom. does try to abduct you, put your seatbelt on and drive into something. Yeah. Because your, your seatbelt and yeah. your airbag is going to save you, but that person who's trying to abduct you or whatever, they're the one that's going to get injured. They're going to go through the windshield and, you know, you might get banged up and, and injured, but you know what? <laughs> they're going to be a lot worse off. Yeah. So little things, like you said, those scenarios, you play them in your mind and you think, what could I do to, to assist? Now, I want to get to show your website a little bit here. We're, we're getting into a lot of talking. Um, and then uh, I'll ask you for some, some must-haves. So the company that, uh, that you're an owner of is Mission X. And uh, for those who watch the, the YouTube channel and the videos, uh, I'm going to bring that, that up. If not, for the others, they can go to um, the, uh, the website Mission X. Uh, dot com the the company uh maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, uh mission x and uh what they do and uh, we'll talk about you personally as well sure um this all started when myself and my business partner uh who's a former uh british sas trooper we were both working at a, a special operations training center in jordan and when we left um both he and I had done some film work uh, advising in, in the film industry. And um, we love adventure. He's a, actually a, a record holder, world climber on Everest and, and many other places. Wow. And so we decided to kind of tie it all together. We, you know, we, we loved what our career paths had done for us. And we just kind of wanted to mix that all together. So we started providing um, uh, high-end adventures um, for uh, – for, for folks all over the world. And then um, 
basically doing film and TV, advising on mostly war films, but um, a variety of other things as well. And that's that's really what uh, what Mission X is all about. And uh, and, and what we find with the adventures is that uh, the people who take them usually they have they have plenty of money. They have what they seem like would be a perfect life, but they're still missing something. And what they're missing is uh, is meaning and yeah. um, purpose. And um, we found that meaning and purpose can be provided when we put you in a tribe-like environment where you're around people who everybody is pulling uh, their weight. Everybody's a spoke in the wheel. You're doing something hard, something challenging, something dangerous. And that's where camaraderie comes from. And that camaraderie provides purpose and meaning in your life. And that's essentially what it's all about. Wow. That's, that's really wild. So tactical adventures, highly charged, realistic war game scenarios. That sounds, I want to do something, man. <laughs> we'll do that's, it. that's pretty neat. So you do different survival missions and special yeah. operations. So you kind of build a, a scenario and then the person goes through the mission. Yeah, it's, and that's obviously it's, why it's, it's called Mission of, X. Um, we, we did it. We did this very thing for, um, if you've ever remember the show, uh, Top Gear. Now those, yeah. Clarkston and those two guys, they went on, now they're doing something for Amazon called The Grand Tour. Uh, they contacted us and they wanted to do a TV show or an episode uh, about it. So we took them and we immersed them uh, uh, in, in, a, in a situation like that and they turned the whole show out about it. And that's actually on the, on the site as well. There's some great uh, cinematography and, and footage and all that. Oh, cool. I love that show, Top Gear. That. I'm a car guy, so. Oh, oh yeah, well, you know the cars had to be part of it too. They brought oh, sure. In, they brought in an Audi, and you know we did all kinds of crazy stuff. It was a lot of fun. Um, but but yeah, that's that's really the, the 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 crux of it. Very cool. And then the other half of that is the the film and TV support and training and providing that technical advice and professional you know uh, experience to assist in the realism of TV and film. Yeah. I, I'm a movie guy. I love movies. I was always one of those, you know, uh, these guys, you know, always arbitrary, you know, quoting random things from movies, you know, or, or, <laughs> pick, you know, picking out random character actors from films and stuff. And so I love movies growing up. So, uh, but one of the things that bugged me, like probably a lot of guys was the lack of accuracy, you know, in certain movies and, so, you know, you finger inside the trigger, you know, while they're, uh, you know, pointing weapons at each other, you know, their, their comrades or whatever the case may be. So it was, it's, it's fun to get in there and, and work with actors and, uh, and help directors, you know, turn out something that's a little more accurate. You don't have full control. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, they right. just do what they want to do something and you're just like, no, don't do that. But they want to do it anyway. And you just got to step just gotta back and it. say, okay. <laughs> yeah. But the guys like me are going to know that's not how you do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, so see, you worked out a lot of movies, man, a lot of movies. So people can check out the websites. Uh, very interesting. And if you're looking for some wild, uh, realistic adventure, uh, Mission X is uh, is what you want to take a look at there. So very cool. And then um, your personal website, uh, which is your name, ckredlinger.com, R-E-D-L-I-N-G-E-R.com, ckredlinger. Uh, has uh, some information about uh, yourself and it uh, looks like a whole bunch of uh, sort of like some personal development information on uh, anxiety, depression, safety, leadership, overcoming adversity, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the, the, the base station for my storytelling and um, content creation as far as uh, um, some uh, TV ideas and things like this. But, for the most part, it's, it, it gives me the outlet to, uh, to write. And writing gives me solace. I, I enjoy writing, and I enjoy storytelling. So um, it's, it's kind of a, a – it, it, it's the thing that brings peace into my <laughs> – and calming into my life. That's awesome. So very cool. So we appreciate you having on. So a um, couple last things before I let you go here. Um, as I, I knew we were going to blow through this hour, man. <laughs> um, for the average citizen, what would you consider to be must-have skills that would give them the greatest chance of surviving some sort of, you know, bad situation, shall we say? Sure. So uh, I, I think about it in terms of 
taking care of yourself before the ambulance gets there. You know, the ambulance will probably be seven minutes out on mm -hmm. average. So what can happen to you in that seven minutes? Um, the two preventable deaths usually revolve around blood loss, massive hemorrhaging, uh, or airway. And with airway, uh, it essentially means that your brain's not getting oxygen. And every minute that goes by without oxygen to the brain is 10% less survivability chance. So um, I, like to tackle, I, I like to tackle those things because once the paramedics get there, they can do amazing stuff. Right. But they can't stop the bleed, bleeding out in the first you know, seven minutes and they can't you know, deal with the breathing part because the, they're not there yet. So, so like basic first aid skills. Well, yeah, so learn CPR. I mean, gosh, CPR is such an easy thing. You know, 30 compressions, two rescue breaths. Uh, you can almost go and do it just from hearing that. Right. Um, and just keep going and don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, learn, learn how to use an AED. Uh, because if you're really lucky, it'll happen where there's an AED and, you know, a defibrillator. And that defibrillator is a game changer um, as far as uh, jump starting the heart. And they're um, all over the place in public yeah, places yeah, I, and schools. I, I, I love to have them around. Um, and then as far as the bleeding control goes, um, you know, learn, go get a class. They're, they're everywhere now. Learn how to uh, stop massive hemorrhaging, heavy bleeding. Um, if you've got somebody who has got heavy bleeding and they're not breathing, uh, a lay person might think, let me tackle the breathing part first, but you want to go after the bleeding part first. If they got massive hemorrhage, you want to put a tourniquet on that thing. You want to get that under control because they'll bleed out faster than um, the, the, the issue with the brain dying over, you know, however many several minutes it is. You can bleed out in a couple few minutes. So go out, get that training. Hopefully you'll never need it, but God forbid if it ever does happen to you, it's a game changer. Um, so those are my, those are my always go-to skills, I think, that are must-haves in any household. I keep tourniquets in my car now. I keep tourniquets everywhere because I really have an appreciation of how fast somebody can bleed out. And uh, a seven minute response time is not going to do anything for you. No. And then of course you can always make, you know, a, a homemade tourniquet. I mean, you got a belt, use your belt as a tourniquet, right? You could rip off, you know, portions of clothing. You could find things that you could use in a, in a pinch if you had to. Yeah. But it's interesting. Tourniquets are an option. I, yeah. they're, they're pretty cheap though these days. I oh mean, yeah, you could buy. You know, I'm just saying I, if you don't I, have one. Yeah, right? I pepper those things everywhere. So. <laughs> the uh, I, I'm sure people are going to be interested uh, and say, "Wow, he said like life saving skills as opposed to let's say life taking skills," uh, which is something that um, I was not expecting you to say. I will say that. Um, you know, I was going to say, you know, you've learned how to, you know, protect yourself through some sort of uh, defensive, you know, classes or that sort of thing, which is obviously still a very good idea. But uh, having the life saving skills is something that could save a life uh, when there is some sort of, you know, whatever it happens to be, uh, whether it's an active shooter or a bomb or an explosion or even a natural disaster, because, you know, we've got man made <clears throat> threats and then we have, you know, threats that come from Mother Nature. And they're equally deadly, right? It's a, it, Mother Nature doesn't discriminate either. So, you know, if there's going to be an earthquake or a hurricane or a snowstorm or a fire or a flood, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're not prepared to deal with that, then that's something that is a, is a problem. And so I kind of go, we kind of go full circle to, you know, the first thing you got to do is figure out what those threats are that exist to your personal safety. Like, for example, I, I brought up a flood. I live very close to... Uh, the Susquehanna River, which had a crazy bad flood in 1972 from Hurricane Agnes that, you know, devastated this whole area. Well, it happened once, it could happen again. They raised the dikes. I, my whole thing is, hey, you could raise the dikes to the moon. It doesn't matter. If they break or there's a hole in them, it's still going to flood. So, you know, there's still, you know, risks that we all have. You know, if you're on California, wildfires. If you're in the Midwest, there's snowstorms. You know, if you live near bodies of water that are prone to flooding, you got to worry about that. And, uh, and not just in your daily life and your daily routines, but also when you're traveling, right? Because, you know, we go on vacation, we go places for business, and we're places that we are unfamiliar with. And I know one of the things that I do whenever I'm going to, like, go away on vacation or if I'm traveling somewhere is I will look at what 
is ne- around where I'm going to be. What I'm going to look up the the layout of the hotel before I get to it. People are like you're nuts. I'm like, why am I nuts? It takes you two seconds online to find it, and now I got it, and I know where exits are. It takes two seconds to look at something on Google Maps and see where there are natural borders and barriers to where you're going to be that might prevent you from being able to quickly leave in a certain direction. So those are small little things that you can do that some people might say, oh man, you're paranoid. No, I'm not. I'm prepared. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Middle of the continuum. It's, it's you know, it's the it, same thing as if you're, you know, you're traveling to a foreign country, you know, get at a minimum, get on the State Department's website, travel advisory, and read about what's happening in that country. Learn about, you know, the, what kind of crime issues they're having, you know. Right, get the and embassy information. On the website for the State Department. Embassy yeah, have the embassy's there. phone number. So you know if you do run into a problem, you don't got to be like, oh, my God, I don't know how to call the embassy. Well, if you put it in your phone before you leave or you write it on a piece of paper and stick it in your wallet or better yet, do both, right? If there is a major problem where you, when you are traveling in another country, you've got some way of reaching out to get assistance. And, I mean, we could, we could talk all day about the different things that you can do, but um, the bottom line is look at your life, look at your, your risks, look at what you have to to worry about in a realistic sense. Like I say, don't worry about you know, a zombie apocalypse or an alien invasion or an asteroid hitting the earth, but worry about what to do if there's a fire or a flood or you know, an active shooter or workplace violence or any number of things that could affect any one of us you know, on any given day. And so, um, so I think we'll, we'll end with that other than um, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners before I let you go? I'll just say that I, I think what you're doing is great. This is a, a, a great uh, uh, place for people to get information. And uh, I, so I applaud you for that. I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk. Um, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm all about um, uh, helping other folks uh, and hopefully prepare them before, you know, they have to, uh, to, to, to experience something. And I hope they never do. But if they do, um, we want them to, to survive it and we want them to flourish afterwards. So, Absolutely. Well put. So, uh, CK, I appreciate it. If our listeners want to learn more about you or Mission X, they can go to missionx.com. Uh, I'm sure they could also probably search for that on social media, you know, through different, you know, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, right? Or your name, CK Redlinger, C-K-R-E-D-L-A-N-G-E-R. I'll make sure Thanks I you. put that in the, uh, in the notes. Um, so uh, that's awesome, and uh, I do want to thank you again. And, of course, uh, thanks for being on, and thanks to our listeners for tuning in. And you can always get more information, past episodes uh, at safetytalkpodcast.com and also the videos of the show at safetytalkvideos.com, which takes you right to our YouTube channel. And so, as always, until I see you next time, stay safe.